guys, welcome to today's conversation. We are going to um, go ahead and get started. We're gonna give just a couple minutes for folks to um, come out of the waiting room. Um, and then we're gonna go ahead and start the conversation. Welcome, thank you so much for joining us. Um, really quickly, um, I will introduce myself. I am Sarita Edwards. I am the co-founder and CEO here at the EWE Foundation. We are a healthcare facility, um, a healthcare advocacy organization. We facilitate resources for families living with uh, rare disease Edwards syndrome, which is commonly known as trisomy 18. We also provide resources and support for families living with just rare diseases, medical complexities, and special health needs. Um, so just a really quick, um, a few housekeeping announcements. This conversation is being recorded. Um, you can access the video replay on our uh, EWE Foundation YouTube channel. You can also catch a audio replay of the, today's conversation on our Being Rare podcast. Um, this event has been approved for one CEU. So if you said at registration you were interested in that CEU, um, you will receive an email certificate of attendance after today's presentation. Give us a couple of days to get that to your inbox. Um, if you have any questions or comments during the conversation, please use the chat box or the Q&A. We will try to get to those uh, as we're talking. So today's conversation is about moms and mental health, the importance of self-care. Um, Self-care is, is really just taking all the steps necessary um, for your physical health and your well-being. And that's everything from hygiene and nutrition to managing stress and seeking medical care. Um, Self-care is important to maintaining a healthy relationship with yourself. And it's all about the things that we can do um, to look after our own mental health. Joining us for today's conversation, we have Stephanie Allen, who is a licensed professional counselor and mental health services coordinator. We have Shanae Jackson, who is a coordination of benefits analyst and parent advocate. Dr. Ashley Perkins is a doctor of pharmacy and a mental health advocate. Parvati Krishnan is the Global Advocacy Alliance Director and a parent advocate. And Robin has not joined us yet, just yet, but um, she is a clinical consultant and um, a patient and a parent. So um, really to get started with the conversation, let me just first say thank you guys for being here with us. I appreciate you um, joining us for today's conversation. So I really want to start the conversation um, with you, Stephanie. Um, just ask the LPC. Um, I would love for you to kind of just give us that that brief overview of what exactly is mental health? And um, can you explain for us just the difference between a mental health diagnosis and just your normal day-to-day -day, you know, anxiety because you're running late or um, those feelings of sadness that are not necessarily depression? So I'd like for you to start us off there. Okay, well, all right. Um... Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I love any opportunity to um, advocate for mental health, and I love the specific topic for moms here. I'm also a mom of three um, boys as well. So, um, you know, mental health in general is our emotional, psychological, um, and social well-being. And it, it's, it impacts how we think, how we feel, how we act, how we behave. Um, and it's a part of all of us. I and mean, we all have mental health. Mental health is a part of our health. It's just one aspect of that. Um, everybody can have a bad, a bad day. Everybody can struggle mental health wise. Um, and we can also have great mental health days too. You know, sometimes we can think of it like a continuum of mental health and everybody's kind of normal range may be a little different as well, but um, what, what health means to you. Um, it, it can be a little um, difficult sometimes to differentiate between what is normal, <laughs> right? What is really normal, um, but then also what might be considered a mental health challenge or even a mental health diagnosis. So I'll just start maybe kind of differentiate some of those terms for us so then we can move, move beyond that too. 
Um, so a mental illness um, is a diagnosable mental health condition. And, you know, a mental health professional, a medical doctor would use the DSM-5 criteria to diagnose something. Typically, it's associated with um, a certain level of distress and even difficulty in functioning. Um, Whereas uh, a mental health challenge might also include mental illness, but it might not be something that's been diagnosed. It could just be a struggle in mental health, a challenge that someone hits. Um, and then we all have um, just that, those kind of, like you mentioned, a mental health day, that anxiety on the way to school this morning. I actually had that myself, right? So it, it doesn't mean that um, someone who's having uh, a really anxious moment is diagnosed with uh, anxiety disorder, although they certainly could be. Um, but anyone, because all of us have mental health, um, can experience this, ups and downs and sideways, I guess. But we mm -hmm. can experience a little bit of all of the above, as well as recognizing that there is a real um, medical diagnosis for mental illnesses um, and mental disorders, too. So we have a, lo a large and a wide spectrum to cover when it comes to mental health. You know, the most important thing I think of is that we know it involves us all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good, um, like, I love how you explained it and just kind of put it in those everyday terms and those everyday scenarios. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times we we feel like um, um, it, it's not a challenge or it doesn't apply to our situation. But um, but like you just said, we always have we, we all have those those moments where we're just kind of flipped upside down when it comes to our mental health. And I think that's why it was so important for us to have this conversation. Just just as moms and motherhood, why is it so important for us to to be in tune with our mental health and our mental stability? And um, and again, I want to start that one with you, Stephanie, um, as the as the LPC on the panel. Um, yeah, it, it, it is very important uh, for moms to be in tune with their mental health, um, you know, because moms rule the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really as mothers, um, as moms in whatever capacity that is, we have such a tremendous influence, um, over those little people in our lives or who, who grow up to be big people. Um, so it's a great responsibility for sure. Um, we also have this very unique, um, and important role of modeling what, uh, mental wellness looks like and what coping with mental health challenges looks like. So, you know, recognizing an awareness of your own mental health as a parent um, is so important because it impacts so deeply those around you. And it's very interesting with mental health because mental health is so personal. Mental health is very personal to each one of us. And yet, it impacts so many of us around uh, the, the ones of us around us. So it is personal, but it, it, the impact is um, outside of ourselves. So, you know, being aware of that, how mental health touches almost every aspect of our life. Um, and it's hard because as moms, we tend to put everybody else first and, um, you know, we come, we come down on the list. Um, but, but being aware of that, the importance of our own mental health as a part of our own well-being um, mm -hmm. and the influence it has on those around us is tremendous. So thank you for drawing attention to that and, and having a conversation like this today. Mm -hmm. You know, you said, um, you know, just those, the conversations about mental health experiences with mental health, it, it really... Um, Sorry, not sure why someone's ringing my doorbell. <laughs> um, my apologies. Um, but um, you're just talking about those experiences and how they kind of roll over to our communities and our families and, um, you know, the people in our circles. Um, we know that mental health comes with stigma. And, um, and a lot of times, you know, the people in our communities know people that we know or, or don't know have their perceptions about what mental health is and what it looks like and what it means. Um, Ashley, um, I would love for you to speak to um, just that topic. Like, um, why do you think, um, and even share with us your experience 
um, when it comes to mental health and stigma? Why do you think that stigma is there? Um, share with us your experience and how do you think we can do better when it comes to uh, interacting with, with people with uh, mental health challenges? Absolutely. So unfortunately, I found out the hard way um, about mental health and stigma. And, um, you know, stigma can lead to discrimination, unfortunately. And, you know, as a pharmacist myself, um, I never really thought sharing about my mental health would really impact me in a big way. Um, I've always shared, I've always shared with my patients because my thought was if I'm sharing with my patients or with other people, then it shows them that as a medical professional, I also am able to live my life. I'm also able to do these things. It humanizes me to my patients. So it shows my patients that I'm able to do all these things and do, again, it humanizes me to my patients. Um, in my volunteer world, um, I've been a volunteer for a long time and I had been with an organization for 20 years. Again, I don't hide my mental health. I always have been very open about my mental health. Nothing has changed. I've lived with ADHD my whole life um, and then dealt with anxiety, um, agoraphobia. Agoraphobia, for anybody here who does not know what that is, um, is stereotyped in most media and um, movies as the person who never comes out of their house. Um, they're generally the shut-in. Um, we do come out of houses. Um, we function as people. Um, but the technical term is um, that, you know, fear of open places. Um, it's the technical term for agoraphobia. Um, and then OCD um, and PTSD. Um, those are my diagnoses. Um, and what happened was, is somebody chose to use my mental health against me. And they were a friend, they were a board member and I was a leadership seminar chair, meaning I was running the state seminar at the time. Um, I wasn't going to do anything about it. I traditionally had an issue with this person on a regular basis because they didn't like a lot of the time when I would stand my ground and tell them no, they didn't like decisions I made. I wasn't going to make a big deal about it. But when I found out this was not the first time this person had done this, and this was a pattern, I found out, I decided I was going to do something about it. And I reported it. After I reported it, I found I got retaliated against. Um, they didn't do anything. They continued to make it the situation worse. And after eight months of bullying, emotional abuse, and again, retaliation, I left the organization. Um, I, of course, have not returned. And I went on a campaign to raise awareness about discrimination and stigma around mental health. And here I am now. Um, because it's a problem. If somebody like myself, a pharmacist, I now teach um, pharmacy technician students, someone who has all the privilege in the world can be discriminated against for their mental health, somebody who doesn't hide their mental health um, around completely educated people in a volunteer organization, then it can happen to anybody, anywhere, and it happens all the time. And the more open I was, the more I saw it happening and the more I'm seeing it. And now I was like, no, this isn't okay. And I need to do something about it. And I'm not the type to sit down and shush. So I needed to be loud and raise this awareness because this isn't okay. It's just not okay. And so now we raise awareness because and the way we do this is by sharing our stories. We're just people. We're, we're just normal everyday regular people living lives with medical diagnoses, that's it. Mm -hmm. And the way we are going to end stigma is by sharing our stories, showing people that we live lives and that mm -hmm. we do this every day. And that's how we have chosen to end stigma. And mm -hmm. we started a nonprofit and we're sharing stories and that's what we do. And that's how we've chosen 
to do this. And unfortunately I had to learn the hard way. Um, and I, I gained PTSD, unfortunately, because of it. But again, we're gonna raise awareness about this because it's not okay. I think it's so important, um, you know, and good for you. I think, you know, I think it's so important that, that we share our stories and our journeys and raise that awareness. That's the only way you normalize it. Like the more and more you talk about it and put it in front of people to let them know that though there, though there's a difference, um, you know, we're still all just people, right? Like we just, it's, 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 it's another medical diagnosis, just like any other medical diagnosis. And so um, we really have to have those conversations. And I do want to give Shanae and Parvati an opportunity too. you know, have you guys ever experienced um, stigma or um, even if you have, you know, something to say on this particular topic before we move forward, um, Parvati or Shanae? Sure, I'll go first. Uh, um, I think just the understanding or the empathy that we never get for having a child with this condition or having a difficult life, that's not normal. So it's not, you know, childbirth and parenting, a child itself is a lot of work. Um, going through the NICU or, or, or taking your child newborn back to the hospital, not knowing what is wrong, or, or then coming to know that something's really wrong. Um, they're all different layers. It's like a croissant. There's different layers of things that are being added to this, except that we're all crumpling under pressure when it's happening, but are expected to keep it together. Um, I think by the time we finally say, oh my God, how can we handle this? It's too late. Yeah. Because there's so much damage that's been done to us by then already that not only do we have PTSD, we have CTSD, which is, you know, we all know it's chronic stress disorder because now it, we, we come to the realization that, you know, we, the expectations we had of raising that child is completely shattered and is different. So we have to learn, a, we have to just go against the stream and learn a whole new system. The odds are stacked against us. And nowhere as parents or as moms, our first intuition is always like, save the baby, do everything we can for them. We're never, never being thought about to, how are you? How are you processing this? There's no time <laughs> most of the time. But I think by the time the acknowledgement comes to that, it's either too late because we're way down or we're, we're working our way back up so much in the trenches that it's exhausting and we're always playing catch up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest lesson I've learned from living this life is that, um, yes, now I know the importance I, I can see it, um, but I'm still in that trenches, man, like always trying to catch up and just breathe. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's the struggle that we have um, mm -hmm. for the most part. You know, I think when you say, you know, just talking about um, caring for the child and, and just that question of how are you, um, you know, I just wanted to share really, really quickly back in probably 2010, my husband and I, we, you know, we experienced a miscarriage. And I remember just being so low. I mean, I, you know, at the time, I didn't feel like it was depression or anything like that. And I just knew I was feeling different. And I remember um, when I went for my follow-up, you know, they had to, so we, we started losing the baby and I had to have a procedure. And, um, and I remember going back for the follow-up and I, I mentioned to my OB at the time, you know, like, I just, I don't feel right. I'm just having some really low days. I'm staying in the bed all day and um, like, am I okay? And he looked at me and said, um, you're fine. You made it here today. And I said, okay, um, but, but is like, is it normal? Like, am, like, am I good? And, and he just, he completely just dismissed it. And, and, and I want to say, because we talk about mental health so much more now, you know, my hope is his, his, his thinking now would be different if someone came with this, with this same type of converse, conversation. But, um, but, um, you know, looking back, you know, I think I was just really grieving that I had lost you know, this, this child, he, this child had passed away before I could ever make it to term. And I, I think I was just experiencing postpartum depression, even though the child was never born. And, and, and again, my hope is he would see it differently today. 
But I dismissed those feelings because he did. Uh, because he, you know, reassured me that that I was fine. You made it here today, you know, for this appointment. You 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 look well. I completely disregarded those feelings myself. Um, and and I was having thoughts of taking the medicine that the the 800 milligram ibuprofen that they gave. And so so I think I think yes, like Ashley said, we have to keep talking about it. But then too, like you were just saying, poverty, like we have to we have to get in front of it um, and and be able to say, you know, we're not okay. But then we need the person on the other end of that to recognize. Um, you know, the, the the level of conversation that folks are bringing to them. So, Shanae, did you have something to add to this? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add um, to everybody, and thank you for um, having me on this panel as well. Um, and I think just being a mom, when you become a mom, you get that label of you're strong, you're powerful, uh, like you have it all together, and you don't have a chance to have a breaking moment. And that's mm -hmm. what happened for me. I had to be strong. I had to be powerful. And that's what I learned. I had a like a modified behavior where I learned to display strong, powerful, but yet there was a breakdown of something that was going on until I had to come to that point and say, hey, yeah, you guys see me as strong. You guys see me as powerful, but I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think just because you have that stigma of being a woman, you have that stigma of being strong and powerful, you don't have the option to break down. That's not an option. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and then at that point, you know, as kids get older, as they start, you know, leaving out of the home, you know, and as it, it winded down for me, um, I think it was when my son literally, um, he left home and went into the military and I had to go through that whole, learning a whole new life of him you know the military side because that's like a whole other culture you know the military and I think for me that's when I had that moment of okay I'm not okay like I, I'm strong and I'm powerful but literally now I find myself you know going to the doctor and I'm like something's not right you know I'm like I don't feel like you said I don't feel right I'm normally, I'm, I'm strong, I'm, I'm powerful, I'm this mom, I, I'm like, you know, the mama bear, you know, that's who, you know, who they call me to be, but like, something's not right, like, it, it just is not right, so I think that stigma of just being a mom, and being strong, and being powerful, it leaves you that option to not be vulnerable, it leaves you that option to not, to, to not break down, and so I think it's so powerful that we talk about mental health, because mentally in my mind I had began to say you can't break down you are strong you are powerful like you can't do these things like you can't say that you're not okay because everybody sees you as strong and powerful mm -hmm. but yet mentally something wasn't right yeah yeah that's a really really good point you know one of the questions that we got during um registration I think it's perfect to kind of throw it in right here um, and it said, um, um, how do you deal with worry? Um, how do you deal with worry? And this is specific to something bad happening to a child. Um, how do you deal with that worry so that it doesn't consume you? And, um, I, you know, I would love for, you know, if y'all have feedback, um, Stephanie, for sure, um, this is her area of expertise. I think it's all of our areas of, of expertise to some degree, but um, she's clinically trained. So for sure, I want her to speak to that. But but um, I thought that it was just appropriate to kind of plug it in right here. Like, how do, how do we get to the place to where we don't let worry about being strong and powerful, about our employers, about our children? How do we get to the place we don't let that consume us? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. That is a great, you know, because I do feel like there is a part of worry um, and anxiety even that is a normal part of our everyday life. Um, there's something I worry about every day, especially when it regards in regard of, of my, my kids. Um, but 
how do we how do we keep that in check? How do we know when it's out of check? I mean, you know, how do we know when it's too much? I love um, Shanae just listening to you and and Sarita too sharing when you were like, you know, something wasn't right, and that kind of goes back to that first conversation we had about being aware of our own mental health because if we don't have some component of awareness of of what our our kind of normal wellness or range is, then we don't know if it's a, a little a little overboard or a little much. I mean, you know, some some basic questions because I, I get parents that will ask me a lot too. How do I know in my kid is it too much? Like, is this normal or is this too much? You know, so some of the questions you kind of look at are, you know, how often is it happening? You know, what's the frequency there? How intense is it when it does happen? You know, does it impair some type of functioning when it happens? Um, you know, what um, and, and how long does that last? You know, so those are some kind of basic questions to kind of help guide you in this. Is this is this too much? Is this normal? Is this not? Um, but then I'd, I'd always follow that up with um, ask, you know, there are mental health professionals um, that and, and it, you may start with a friend. You may start with uh, a person that you have that safe and connected and trusted relationship with. Um, but then there's also, that's what mental health professionals are there for. Um, you know, they're trained to see people who are having a uh, difficulty coping with a normal everyday issue and they still help them through therapy. And then they also are trained to help uh, treat and diagnose if there is a, a, a mental disorder or a mental challenge, um, maybe beyond a normal scale. So I would ask for help and, and you may have to ask more than one person, right? And I do think that kind of goes back to even what you all were sharing about before is um, it's hard to advocate for ourselves. Um, I'm listening to each of you like, whoa, what amazing advocates for their kids, for their faith, for the community, for mental health. Like you are advocating for so many, but who is advocating for you? Yeah, that's Give a, yourself yeah. permission to advocate for yourself and your own mental health. So if that mm -hmm. doctor's not listening to you, go to somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, ask more questions, push in. It is okay and necessary for you to advocate for yourself and your own mental health. And if you don't know, ask, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. That's really good. You know, so two things that the whole, the doctor thing, myself now, for sure, mm -hmm. 12 years ago. And I think it's just because mental health, it just, it wasn't talked about like it is now. So 12 years ago, it, it absolutely, it completely just shut me down. But I agree, like my myself today, I would totally just go talk to somebody else about it. The second thing that um, Stephanie said that I really wanted to make sure everybody took away was that baseline. Just think about it. You know, you you have a baseline for your blood pressure and, and all this other stuff when you go to the doctor, like what's your baseline? And, and you know when your blood pressure is slightly elevated because they look at your baseline. It's the same with our mental health. Like know what your triggers are and, 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 and know how to, uh, to get in front of it as best you can and then ask for help when you need to. Um, we, we had another question that came in and during registration that I think is perfect to kind of jump in right here. And it says, and it's about advocacy. Um, it says, how can we, how can we advocate um, with our employers so they can kind of create those future benefits to better help um, parents and, and employees? Um, so how can you proactively advocate with employers? Um, you know, I, again, y'all, Ashley, I don't know. I think that's one you could speak to. <laughs> that's, it's a tough one because you have to know because I get this question a lot. I mean, I do. I get this question a lot. And you have to know the environment of the workplace. You really do. Because there has to be an environment in which it's going to be well received. And if the environment isn't going to receive it, because if it's a toxic environment, mm -hmm. it's not going to be re well received. Um, because I've been in toxic environments and 
you can tell them until you're blue in the face, they're not going to receive it. And more than likely, they're going to tell you to sit down and be quiet. Mm. Um, because I was the troublemaker in those places mm. and they just want you to listen um, and not talk. And unfortunately, in those places, they're just going to keep probably causing mental health problems. And you just want to get away from those places, unfortunately. And the best thing for you to do is to look for another job. And I hate to say those things, but truly the best thing for your mental health is to get away from those places. Um, And that's the best thing I can say. Um, Now I work in a place, I'm an adjunct instructor and I teach uh, pharmacy technician students. And this is the first place I've actually asked for um, accommodations for my ADHD from my boss. Um, So in these types of environments, you can go and you can, you can go and you can ask your employer can we do mental health things? Can we talk about mental health? Can we bring in, you know, speakers? Can we, you know, invite these things? Because those are employers and those are places in which mental health type of situations are going to be welcomed. Mm -hmm. Because if you can openly ask your boss for accommodations for your own mental health, these are employers that are going to want to do those things. Mm -hmm. So you really have to feel out your employer first before you can have those conversations. Because right in this, yes, we talk more about mental health, but employers are still at this place where you have such different environments and you have to have an environment that's going to welcome the conversation before you can talk about those things. Because and people ask me, can I ask for mental health things? And my, my question always is, is your employer the type of employer who's going to fire you for mental health or are they going to be open to talking about it? Mm-hmm. And if somebody pauses and can't answer me right away, then I say, don't talk about it because look what happened to me. Mm-hmm. And I never thought anyone would have done that to me. So I always tell people caution if you don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I just, I mean, I just want to kind of piggyback and say, you know, I, and you're speaking from experience, right? Like you're, you're, you're speaking totally from experience and, you know, for, for someone who has not had to have that conversation with an employer, you know, I, I, you know, I'm going to be on the other side of the spectrum and I'm going to say, go right in and, and kind of, (laughs) Talk about what your needs are, um, you know, and 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 have those conversations because for me, I guess I just I feel like you you really don't know if they are an employer who embraces mental health until you have a conversation and 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 your conversation could open up that door, you know, if it's something that they've not thought about before. But I totally get you are talking lived experience here, yeah. um, but but I think you know, I think one of the things that you said was to just have the conversation. And so I think you mm-hmm. should be willing to, to, you know, just kind of talk to your HR folks and, and talk to your, your, um, your boss and just kind of see what things are in place. And if nothing's in place, again, I think that could be mm-hmm. an opportunity to create something. Um, There's so a I lot of want- indirect hear- ways. There's a lot of indirect ways that you mm-hmm. can go about it to feel it out. So you're not putting yourself directly on the line yeah. exactly mm-hmm. exactly yeah. just thinking too you know without even uh in a safe way you know thank you for reminding us ashley just kind of being intentional about those boundaries and what might be safe but even in a non-personal way to be able to ask your employer yeah. your hr what are the mental health benefits that our company yeah. offers that, yeah. so it's not necessarily it, you know it protects you personally um and that mm-hmm. might give you some more insight but you might find in asking those questions that other people are asking those questions too and your employer mm-hmm. might see the benefit of investing there or um maybe there are benefits that you're not aware of um mm-hmm. i was having a great conversation with someone the other day about hey these are great company benefits like these yes. this is this EAP program or these healthcare yeah. benefits that are covering a lot of therapy costs now, 
you know, how do we get the, the word out about that? Because this is such a great resource. So I do think you can ask us and, um, you know, and maybe in a way that would just help know kind of what, what's already, exactly. there, what's their, the possibility of it. Because right. it can be a great resource to use. Right, right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. I so think, I, sorry, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. One of, one of the things that we we struggle with is acknowledging that there's an issue. And I think as moms or parents or caregivers, we first need to even know like, okay, what can we do? What can we not do? So that we can then be clear when we're approaching a new, an employee, either existing or new, that these are our boundaries. This is our reality. We do have these issues. And, you know, just putting it out there and saying, I want to work here, but I want you to work with me to make this a good environment for all of us. Because I know that, you know, as your parents or our moms or caregivers, we, we, are very hardworking, whether it's at our work or taking care of our children. And so explaining that, being upfront about that and telling them this would make my life easier um, and this would make me be more productive would actually open up that conversation and make the environment less hostile and, and, and more um, collaborative because mm -hmm. you, know, you, you want the best for yourself and you want the best for the company you're working for. So regardless of where you are, um, I think that's, that's also a good way to go. Like understand what your needs are first before you go to them and say, this is what will make my life better. Right, right, right. I do want us to transition a little bit to the self-care aspect of the conversation. So um, I want to kind of start that conversation. And I do see the questions in the, in the, uh, the Q&A. We're going to get to those in just a second. Um, but to kind of transition to the self-care piece, um, one of the so one of the first questions to kind of lead into that conversation is what does self-care look like um you know that was kind of our lead in to this this piece of the conversation and i have to say we all that was one of the questions that came in during registration um how do you start the self-care process and what kind of things can I do? So, um, you know, I'd like for Parvati and Shanae to, to kind of lead that conversation. I know you guys have some, some different um, self-care practices, but both really, really good that you do for yourself. So either one of y'all can lead that. Oh, well, this is Shanae. I'll start off. Um, well, first for me, um, to, to start for me, I had to realize that self-care started in the mind um, and I also had to realize that self-care does not equal selfishness, um, you know, being selfish. Um, so for me, um, number one, I did take the time because, like I said, there were some things that um, I knew that was not right and I needed to speak to someone. So the first thing I did was I did seek out counsel um, through my employer um, because I do work for a company that does have um, an EAP program. It does have life to learning. And I did, you know, every week resource that my company had out, I, I signed up for everything. Like I was just like, yeah, I'm signing up for this. I don't even know what it means, but I'm going to sign up for it. <laughs> and, so, and so for me, um, and in doing that, and I worked for this company for like 19 years. And in doing that, I did not realize that they sent me books, they sent me resources, they sent me like papers to fill out. And, you know, doing self-care, I did not realize that, um, not doing self-care, I did not realize that I wasn't aware that I didn't know what my favorite color was. I wasn't aware that I didn't know what type of flower that I like because I always like put my children, my husband, my family first. I didn't realize that I had even put myself on the back burner. Um, and so for me, what I started to do was I just started to do things that I didn't know if I liked it or not. So I started planting flowers. I started going for walks. Um, I started, you know, just doing, finding things that I've never tried before um, just to see, okay, well, do I like this or do I not like this? And then, you know, through my company, they gave us someone that would, would kind of check up with us. And so the other thing that I have now implemented within my life is I have an accountability partner. 
Like I have someone that I'm able to, you know, go to talk to, you know, if something's not right. And it may not be the same person because I don't go to everybody for the same thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, you know, depending on what the situation it is or what what may come up, you know, I know that I have someone that I can go through, be it through my job, be it through my church, be it through a friend. You know, I've put those people in place where I'm not afraid to say, hey, Okay, today I woke up. I'm not feeling too good. I'm, I'm not in a good mood. Okay, let's talk this out. And, and the other thing I've learned to do is to open my mouth and to speak and to say, hey, you know, and, and then the other thing is educating myself on what's mental health, educating myself on what was self-care, because I didn't know what that was. You know, as a mom, as a grown woman, I really did not know what it was and what it looked like. But when I realized that self-care did not equal selfishness, and that I did not have to leave myself out and I didn't have to leave myself at the bottom, uh, I think things kind of start um, revolving for me and e even in helping my, my son. Um, and this is the other thing that I learned was if I don't take care of me, I can't take care of my children. I can't take care of my husband. I can't take care of the other things that need to be taken care of. So it's not, I think I want people that's listening to know self-care is it does not equal selfishness there it's a place where you can do things for yourself just find something that you never would have thought that I would you would like to do and just try it it doesn't mean that you have to continue to do it but just try it just to see just do new things um and that's what I have learned to do that's what I've you know implemented in my own life and I do I take one day out of the week and I just, everybody, I'm like, okay, today I'm not mom. I'm not doing anything. I'm just taking care of me, you know, and, and I do whatever I want to do that day. If it's just go eat some ice cream by myself, get in the car and ride by myself. I take that time. And when in that time, I'm taking inventory of, okay, are you have anxiety? Is it fear? Is it this? I'm taking inventory of what's going on with Shanae, because yeah. if I don't, then I'm not able to be in really be there for my children or be that advocate for my son that I need to be because I'm not taking care of me, if, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. It does. And I'm going to let poverty go. But, uh, you know, I was just going to say real quick, that's kind of what poverty was just saying. You 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 got to check in with yourself, right? So you will know. And I think Stephanie touched on it too. So you will know what to present, right? Like you, yeah. you, can't, you can't explain to your husband or your children if you are out of touch with yourself. Uh, go ahead, Parvati. I know you were going to speak to that too. I think the whole notion of self-care has taken such a hallmark term at this point because, you know, it's like, oh, everybody needs self-care. Well, yes, but that's different for people who are dealing with a child or a loved one with a medically complex condition. Our self-care well, we may not have the time, effort, money, or, or, or patience to go sit and get a pedicure. And that's not really realistic because we'll go broke just doing that, which is not an option. So I think for us, self-care is really knowing, do I just want to sit and have a hot cup of coffee? Um, do I want to just brush my hair? Do I want to walk? Do I want to? It is just understanding, like Shanae said, what is that one thing yeah. today? That will just that I can do with, within the confines of our life that that you know will will give me that um, that that space to breathe. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, y'all can hear me. If if I'm robotic, then let me know. I'll go off camera. <laughs> but um, I think for for me, when we did that, uh, what really struck across as important to me was talking. Um, you know, and I know Sarita has this awesome podcast. Um, for me, it was sharing our story. Um, to me, that gave me comfort. To me, that that was part of my self-care because it was also therapy except a lot of people were listening to me with this therapy yeah. um, but it was sharing our story because it felt like a release it felt like hopefully this will somewhere somewhere help someone um, going through this to see okay you're not alone um, and so that included sharing pictures of my children um, you know and, and and one thing I always say is grief is, is such a hard word to describe but for folks like us who we're taking either care of ourselves or taking care of someone else. Um, I grieve the child I lost and I grieve the child I'm taking care of right now who has this medically complex condition uh, because, you know, it's constant. It's every day. I'm always wishing it was something else, uh, but it's not. And so it's, it's how do I honor that? I honor that by talking. I honor that by sharing the beads of courage that my daughter um, had throughout her lifetime, because that shows not only her struggle, but it shows my struggle that, with the life that she had. 
Um, so I make it a point to always tell people like this is this is the life that we all had as a family. Um, and so for me, it's sharing our story, writing about it, um, presenting it. It's sort of like a cathartic self-care. And I'm the only one in my house that doesn't, nobody else wants to talk anything about it. But to that point, we each have our ways to care for ourselves and we need to figure out what that is um, for us. Mm-hmm. And I will say really quickly, if anybody would love to hear Parvati's story about those bees, um, she uh, was a speaker at uh, our LEAP conference last year, and um, there is a feature of just her presentation on our uh, YouTube channel. So please, you can go and check that out if you are interested in learning and, and hearing more about that, that sweet story. Um, I did want to kind of throw in a question that came in during registration. Um, because I think it kind of aligns with this whole conversation. And it says, how can moms, especially single moms, get past the feeling of guilt when taking out time for self-care? You just have to not be guilty. <laughs> you know, that's, <laughs> you, that's, I mean, you just, because guilt is real. Um, like I, you know, I know for myself, I have felt that that guilt feeling Oh, yeah. I'm leaving everybody else out if I'm doing something for me. Um, but kind of like Shanae, I think, you know, I've always, you know, felt like I had to make sure everything else was good or in place or in order. Um, and, um, you know, I will say, you know, my husband, he'll push me to to do things mm-hmm. or um, you should this or you should that or whatever. It's just, you know, it's just hard sometimes to let go of the things that you're just so used to to handling and 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 making sure it gets done yourself. Ashley, you were about to say something? I call it my re I call it my recharging mm-hmm. because I'm recharging. Yeah. Um because again like you hear self-care and people are always looking at me like self-care is like so, you know cuz the selfish thing and all that like yeah. I said and I'm like so I've started calling it my recharging because I'm recharging my batteries, you know, again, I have ADHD. And so I get drained real easily. So I call it recharging. And um, so that's what I've started to call it. Um, And so I recharge on a regular basis. And I used to get real like guilty and feeling bad, and all of that. But um, after everything I went through in 2019, um, my son lost his mom for eight months because I literally couldn't function. And, um, my husband was keeping me alive practically. So, um, I had to get over that guilt. Um, because again, I, I felt so guilty for so long because again, I lost all that time with my son. Um, so now when I'm recharging my battery, I'm like, I'm getting short spurts, getting back together. And then I get to go spend time with my son. Um, because again, I I lost all that time for that short or for that long period of time. So I kind of view it as now, you know, now I get back to it and Sarita disappeared. Sorry, it's throwing me off. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll go next. I like that I'll term, Ashley, it. the recharge. <laughs> recharge. I like that a lot. I, I often use that illustration. Um, you can't pour from an empty cup. I'm sure you've yeah. probably heard that before too. That That's something that helps my mom guilt sometimes. I think I, there's a lot that I want to, um, you know, pour out and offer to my kids. But if mama is, if, if mama's done, then nobody's getting anything. So you know, thinking of it as recharge time or refilling that cup. Um, I think that's essential. I mean, the mama guilt is real. And I love what you said, Sarita, too, about, you know, have people in your life that will help speak the truth in that to you, because sometimes we don't see it ourselves. Um, But when you have others that will encourage you in that, um, and, you know, whether that's a friend or a spouse or a community group or, or who it is that, that encourages you in that. And then I'll just say one more thing about what Shanae said, self-care started with a mindset. And mm-hmm. sometimes I think we feel like, sometimes I don't even want to think about, I used to not even want to think about self-care because to me, it was like another checklist of things I should be doing yeah. that I was failing at because yeah. I was doing 
so many other things. There's too many lists on my desk right now. So, you know, I, self care shouldn't be another list of shoulds. Yeah. Um, it is a a very personal thing for you. So instead of being unrealistic, it can be something that's very realistic. What in this day? What in this moment yeah. um, is a recharge for my mental wellness? Um, what is something that helps me reset my mindset? And it doesn't have to be this list of, of things to do. It is a, what do I need kind of right now? And that goes back to us being able to assess our own mental health and mental wellness and where we're at, because what we need is different at different times. And mm -hmm. sure, you know, getting a pedicure or a bubble bath yeah. may be nice, but that might not be very realistic for that moment at all. But there might be something in that very moment um, that works for you. And um, again, is I'm going to use actually that recharge that fills that cup. And um, essentially your mental well, you know, the mindset of your mental wellness is important. Yeah. And as a mom, you know, your mental wellness impacts your kids. And so, um, you know, that, that, that is what I would say to that. We all do struggle with that. So it is real. Mm -hmm. um, but self-care is, is important. I love that. Yeah. Good I want to, oh, no, go ahead. I would just, I, I was going to, um, I was pulling up this Q and A stuff so we can get these quick questions, but go ahead, Shanette. I was just going to say um, to the person that asked the question about the guilt, um, I just wanted to throw out there that we have to remember that guilt is also an emotion. And, you know, with it being an emotion, sometimes you have to uh, just kind of replace that emotion. You know, it's something sort of like fear. You know, you have to replace it with something else. So I would just encourage you, you know, um, number one, it's an emotion. And sometimes our emotions, if we don't get them under control, they can take us down a path that, you know, is really not good for us, you know, or take us off course. But if you're able to just um, remember that it's an emotion and then replace that emotion with something else, you know, try to replace it with something else and not to feel guilty because just like um, the panelists just said, like your mental health, it matters, like your self-care, it matters. So um, I would just like, you know, just take that time. to, like you said, sit back and just like, okay, why am I feeling guilty, you know, or, or talk to yourself, you know, why am I feeling guilty about, you know, doing something for myself, you know, because think about it like this, if it was the children, you would jump to it with no, with no, you know, you would, it's just something that you will automatically do. And so, you know, you have to put yourself in that, in that line with the children, the husband and, and everything else that goes on, you matter, just like she said, you matter. So I would just, like I said, it's an emotion that sometimes we have to, um, you know, just try to put our, put ourselves in it. Because like I said, for me, I had to learn that the mental capacity of, you know, you matter just like everybody else, you know, and not feel guilty that I started doing things for Shanae, you know what yeah. I'm saying? You know, doing things for me, I'm not going to feel guilty if it's 15 or 20 minutes out of the day that I do something for myself because I'm replacing that guilt with actually doing something for myself, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does make sense. Um, it does. Um, so really quick, um, one of the questions in the, in the box is about spousal support. And it says, what type of support would be helpful to foster good mental health? What's the best way to ensure I'm making a positive impact on my spouse's mental health? Um, that's a good question. You know, personally for me, I think, I think asking the question um, shows effort. Like it shows that effort of I'm trying to um, complement good and positive mental health. Um, um, and everybody's on the, everybody on this panel is, is a spouse. Everybody's married. So feel free to jump in. I mean, I know we are, we're running out of time, but, but I would just, I would say, um, I would say, you know, you, you just as, as a spouse, you have to be in tune. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you have to be in tune with each yeah. other and, yeah. and be able to kind of recognize, um, when, when issues arise or, um, you know, I think, that whole be a good spouse thing is relative. You know what I mean? Like it, yeah. 
Because it's, it's not going to be the same for everybody. everybody. Yeah. I know for I know for my husband, it's been hard because not only has my husband have to, had to be a partner, he's also had to be a caregiver for me mm-hmm. um, because I suffer from some severe mental illnesses. So, and I've gone through some, you know, lows. And especially now that I deal with PTSD and mine's active, um, it's been rough for us. Mm -hmm. Um, So for my husband, he's had to do both of those roles. So now that I'm doing better, he is really, he, I'm very lucky and I'm very fortunate because my husband tries very hard Mm -hmm. to ask the questions and to listen and to do everything he can to understand my brain, which I don't even understand most of the time. Um, I call my brain a butthead because it is. And so a lot of the times he tries very hard and even he's in therapy because he's trying to understand himself while trying to also understand me. So for that's how we've been trying to do it. Um, and so open communication, yeah, mm-hmm. I think is huge. Mm-hmm. And Come that's on, Parvati. Do. Oh, sorry, sorry, Ashley. I, I know Parvati was going to say something too. Nope, you. that's all I had. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, I just, I, I think for any relationship in general, it's important first to take care of yourself. Um, if you can focus on your mental health and if you can focus on prioritizing that, a part of that will also include supporting your partner. Um, supporting that other caretaker um, and encouraging them. If, if you see positive benefits from taking care of your own mental health, you will bring to that table um, an equal partnership that is, is positive, that the other person will see the benefits of getting their own. Um, I think each person is responsible for taking care of themselves first. And it's a hard concept for all of us as caregivers to get. Um, and and I, mean, we were with, I mean, obviously, we're not alone in this, but we've gone through grief of losing a child. We've gone through the grief of like taking care of both children that have been medically complex, but we each have our own ways of dealing with that grief. Um, we have our own styles of dealing with mental health or, or, or whatever it is that we want to fix. So I think personally, I, I take care of myself and I first figure out what my boundaries are, what I can and cannot help. Um, because there are times when I'm overwhelmed and, and he may be overwhelmed too. And so it may not be the best time for me to put my focus on, on, on my spouse versus myself. Um, and so remembering that we first have to be rooted, we first have to have our own center, um, while obviously focusing on your partner as well, because I do think it's a partnership, it's a collaboration, it's not um, I'm going to do my own thing. You're going to do your own thing. But it is equally important to remember, I come first. Um, I have to be my best for my relationship, for my child, um, and for everything else that comes after. Um, and I think part of putting yourself first will also support your spouse in recognizing that they also need to put themselves first. So a um, mm. little, little different, but I feel like every, in, at least in our house, it's like, I get therapy, you get therapy, we get therapy. Um, uh, do we have enough therapists? <laughs> no, probably not. <laughs> right. our, my, our, Everybody our child, gets therapy. No, yeah. really. Our child yeah. get, our, we were just talking about this. Our child gets three different therapies a week, just yeah. mental health therapies. And we still <laughs> feel like that's not enough. Um, that doesn't include all the therapies that we get individually and as a group as a family so I mean this is where we are now nine years after being in this journey and so the you know the stigma is so strong but if the stigma was broken there would be more mental health providers everywhere and there would not be a reason for us to have to justify why we're getting this but the fact that yeah. we are um, that we are. Start. and so it's still yeah. a long I think it's awesome ago, but we are definitely here yeah. And I think too, you just have to be willing to, and we're going to wrap up. Got two minutes. Um, I, y'all know I like to try to stay on time to, I like to respect people's time. Um, but I think it's also important in just everything that y'all said, but then too, to let your spouse help. And that's yeah. something that I struggle with. Like, I just, you know, I'm just so used to moving and I, you know, I, I work in the, in the home and my husband works outside of the home. And so sometimes it's just, I'm, I'm trying to help and and not create that extra for him even if it creates the extra for me you know what I mean so you just you have to have that balance and and I'm I'm trying to find it I really (laughs) I really really am 
Um, so I want to thank y'all so much. We could so very easily keep talking, but I do <laughs> want to be conscious of everybody's time. We may have to do a part two. Um, I do see these comments in the chat. Um, one from Kim says, I have a big opinion. Mom guilt will, mom guilt will kill you literally mm -hmm. and figuratively. Cultural and societal expectations set us up to feel that we should be all doing more and perfectly. We have to release ourselves from those confines. Um, and then Candace says the guilt question was hers. She struggled with it. Uh, she struggles with it daily. She finds herself in tears sometimes because she feels selfish. So thank you, Shanae, for that statement of self-care not being the same as selfishness. Hearing someone else says that means a lot. Thank you for sharing that, Candice. Um, thank y'all so much for being here with us today. I appreciate you so much to our panelists, to all of our guests in the audience. Um, I will make sure to put all of their contact information in the description of this video. So if you need to reach out to them, if you want to reach out to them and just build that community of um, mental health supporters, we all we all thrive off of each other. So um, feel free to reach out to the EV Foundation. Let us know how we can help you in any way. Thank y'all so much for being here um, to our guests. Thank y'all so much. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank y'all so much. Have a good one. Y'all have a good day. All right. Bye-bye.